ZFM Stereo, my station, your station. Thank you so much for tuning in and choosing us on this Tuesday evening. Ask the MP. It is only on ZFM Stereo. It is an effort that we bring you every week where we try to bring in the most topical issues that are being discussed in Parliament and give you an opportunity to get in-depth uh, insights into those issues, ask questions uh, and make your comments and contributions. It certainly is valuable and driven by you, the listeners. Uh, you are at the heart of all this, so we encourage you to always get in touch with us. We bring in different MPs so you can hold them to account and so you can uh, interact and interface with them. Get in touch with us. Our numbers are 0772 That is our calling number. 0772 Or you can also get in touch via WhatsApp 0731 Now tonight we're talking to two honorable MPs, Honorable Gonese. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. It is always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you, Farai, and good evening, Zimbabwe. Honorable Mazuisa, great to have you back as well on uh, this platform, on this program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much indeed for having me here tonight. For those who may not already know, but I'm sure both these gentlemen don't need any introduction. Honorable Mazuisa is a legislator for the ruling ZANO PF. Uh, and Honorable Gonesa is representing the MDCT, he also happens to be the Chief Whip. So thank you so much and welcome to the program. Let me begin by unpacking tonight's discussion. Tonight we're obviously t- looking at how Parliament operations are going under this new dispensation. We know that in recent weeks there's been a lot of talk about, you know, they had new administration, 100 days, what has been achieved. Uh, different people you speak to will tell you different things, that uh, there's a change in the way things are doing, bi- people are doing business. Certainly when you go to some uh, government departments that uh, previously were not, uh, you know, functioning as efficiently as they should have, they have changed in terms of their delivery and how th- their outlook and how they are going about their business. So clearly there is a change, but we want to find out from a parliamentary point of view if indeed they are also seeing this new dispensation that is being spoken about uh, uh, you know quite uh, widely let me begin with you honorable gonese Uh, in your own opinion are you seeing anything different and specifically with regards to how this new administration is interfacing with you as parliamentarians okay thank you farai i would like to begin by saying that uh, in my view uh, it has become very fashionable to refer to the new dispensation, to the new era, to the new beginning or whatever. But in my view, it's really a misnomer. Because for me, there hasn't really been any real change in the sense that uh, if you look at it in its proper context, we are looking at the same party, Mm -hmm. which was the governing party before and after. It was ZANU-PF and it is still ZANU-PF. When you look at uh, the president, uh, His Excellency Emerson Mnangago was the vice president to Robert Mugabe. If you look at uh, most of the members of the administration, they are the same people who were in the old administration. So in my view, although it has become very fashionable to refer to it as such, in my own opinion, uh, it's not really a new dispensation, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But be that as it may, I think what has changed, in my view, is more of the rhetoric mm-hmm. in the sense that uh, what... Uh, the current president says differs from what his predecessor used to say. But in terms of what they actually do, there isn't much of a difference. When you look at it from the context of parliament, you will find that uh, the same problems that we had before, where ministers don't usually attend a uh, time, is the same scenario. Mm-hmm. If you watch on uh, Wednesdays, when we have a uh, question time, we still have this problem of ministers not turning up. What has changed to some extent is that, uh, for example, when you've got uh, the Police Bureau meeting, like last week, uh, it started at 9, and we understand from the Speaker, after I addressed the point of order, that the meeting ended at 1 o'clock. But then it was 2.15, there were very few ministers in the House, mm-hmm. and uh, those ministers were sort of leave of absence, their names were read out, but there were still some ministers who did not turn up, who did not show up, and there was no explanation as to why they were not there. And I raised the point that, uh, you know, uh, we have said this time and again, but it seems like our old habits die hard. So for me, uh, when you look again at uh, the issue of our ministers, 
responding to motions on the order paper. There hasn't been much of a difference. So in other words, what has really changed is the talk and not the actions. Why do you think that is? This is the reason why I'm saying that uh, there's nothing new about the new dispensation. You are having the same old people who were occupying government positions previously, and they are the same people. What has slightly changed is that uh, uh, the current president, in terms of what he's actually trying to say, in terms of uh, what comes out of his mouth is different. But in terms of what they actually do to me, there's no real discernible difference. Honorable Mazuis, I want to bring you into the discussion, obviously, to respond to some of those issues. But, you know, uh, we saw a very unprecedented uh, uh, joint uh, effort, a unification across the political divide in Parliament, particularly when an impeach- a motion of impeachment was being, uh, you know, discussed and was on the table. Uh, are we likely to see this unity? Is that a sense of unity prevailing, that sense of oneness, that uh, you know, coming together, is, is, is that something that we continue to see or might continue to see? Or was it just convenient at that time that, you know, you, you needed the opposition to achieve a certain uh, objective and so you united them then? Uh, thank you, Farai. Um, let me perhaps start by responding, I think, to uh, the claim that there's nothing new in the new dispensation. I don't think that that is true at all. It's, it's not supported by the facts on the ground. The people may remain the same, uh, but definitely the approach has changed. Uh, it has changed on many fronts uh, in respect particularly uh, of uh, attempts by the government to lower uh, foreign direct investment in the country. The president has consistently said that Zimbabwe is now open for business. And uh, this is not just rhetoric. We have seen uh, you know, dozens of investors from across the world in the last few weeks come into the country and responding to the call by the president that Zimbabwe is indeed open for business. That that has got to count for something. That is a marked difference uh, from, from the past. There's a clear commitment and determination on the part of the government, which is obviously being spearheaded and led by uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa to make sure that we do things differently, at least uh, as far as uh, the economy is concerned. Um, you know, from a parliamentary perspective, uh, in that particular respect, we have seen various efforts uh, to try and make sure that those bills that have anything at all to do with ease of doing business are expedited. And these bills are innumerable. Um, You have bills, uh, for example, like the Shop Licenses Act uh, bill, the Insolvency Bill, uh, among other bills uh, which have come to the attention of Parliament uh, really for purpose of making sure that when investors come into the country, they do not have any kind of impediment, at least the kinds of impediments that they used to experience in the past. Now, to come to your question about the unprecedented and rather unusual a demonstration of unity that we saw during the impeachment processes, which although were aborted, but were going to go in a concerted way, I think that what you will see is that whenever something of, uh, you know, something that is in the national interest uh, pops up, uh, you are going to see, of course, different political parties coming together and seeking to advance that which they believe is in the national interest. Of course, we have a whipping system. Uh, we have different political parties that seek to advance a certain political agenda which you know, pushes their interests. Uh, but we saw, I think, uh, on that particular occasion, uh, different political parties coming together and trying to push what they believed was, was a common agenda and which agenda they believed was in the national interest. But that, that was, it was not an isolated case. Uh, I think there are uh, various instances in Parliament, uh, especially during the tenure of the 8th Parliament, when members of Parliament from across the political divide have acted in a bipartisan manner. Uh, they've acted collaboratively. I know that, uh, I, I'm sure Honorable Gones will confirm this, that the Special Economic Zones Bill was one such bill where we saw a concerted effort from across the political divide. Uh, you know, members of Parliament coming together uh, trying to make sure that we have a bill that talks and speaks to ease of doing business. And I think that that kind of collaborative approach is the kind of approach that the new dispensation 
parliament session the new government really is requesting members of parliament to to insist on how do you respond to something you mentioned that you know the claims being made by your counterpart are not backed by facts he he has specifically pointed to the fact that ministers are still not turning up for question time uh they are not responding to issues on the motion paper specifically we've got a listener who asks this and you know i think many people want to know this and i'll put it to you Rama Zirisa, what is your party's position relating to that of honorable obet mpofu refusing to answer questions in a parliamentary portfolio committee he's dragging the new dispensation through the mud what is our zanu pf position on this so specifically there's that case that has been pointed out but honorable goodness would mention that you know the ministers are it may be a new day but their old habits are dying hard as he says he put it <laughs> Look, uh, every time we have question time in Parliament, every Wednesday, uh, what the Speaker always does, uh, which I think is not always shared with members of public of the public, is really that uh, he always is at pains to explain why certain ministers are unable for for a whole variety of reasons to attend Parliament. Uh, you have also to bear in mind that uh, ministers uh, have, uh, you know. Uh, mandates uh, within their various portfolios to execute responsibilities in, in different facets that fall within their their purview. Uh, but the Speaker of Parliament is always very clear every time at the start of every session uh, to say Minister so and so has issued an apology and they are unable to come uh, for reason A, B, C, and D. Um, I don't think that you're ever going to find a, a time when you are going to have 100% attendance from uh, cabinet ministers. And and that is to be expected. I think that is natural. Uh, there are certain uh, justifications that will be advanced from time to time, which I think uh, will ma- are going to make sense. But of course, uh, I think whenever cabinet ministers are free uh, to come to, par- to, to parliament, they always avail themselves. And there's, an, there's been an insistence, which I'm very much aware of, uh, from the president that members of cabinet should attend. He was attending religiously when he was vice president. Mm. And, and I'm sure he speaks from a personal perspective when he says cabinet ministers must at all times attend parliamentary sessions. Well, well, Gonesa, before you come in, I know you're itching to come in, but yes, let me put he, this to you, Honorable <laughs> Mazwisa, that if as vice president, and we assume that he was very busy because he oversaw a lot of portfolios, he attended parliament. And, uh, you know, wh- in response to your saying that ministers are busy, indeed, we know they are busy, but what could take more priority than to respond and relate and speak to the issues of the very people who put you into that office coming back to them to uh, report back to them and it's one afternoon a a week Mm -hmm. yeah well look i i did not say that ministers are busy i just said that there will arise circumstances on a particular day for example when a minister is unable to attend and they advance reasons as to why they are unable to attend what we have seen is that the bulk of them tend to attend uh, parliamentary sessions except uh, when you have a political meeting which comes once in three months or so uh, when most of them have to attend political but even in those instances I, I can give you as a very clear example the last political meeting it it ended at only at one o'clock and we sit at two o'clock quarter past two in parliament and so the expectation was that those uh, who are political members were supposed to be in parliament it's unfortunate that some of them chose for one reason or the other not to attend and i think these are some of the concerns that even some of us uh, are beginning to have uh, and they are beginning to eat into the great efforts of the new administration well goodness i'll let you come in but as you're coming in i want to take a a couple of more contributions coming through from our listeners this is uh, crucial because this program indeed does belong to them so uh, let me read a few more here saying uh, Gwenzi and Gweru says why is it ministers are very eager to attend Politburo meetings over government parliament business thank you so much Gwenzi uh, someone here says I agree with the MDC chief whip uh, and then uh, you know I see the computer has just blacked out there with the whatsapp message but certainly we'll come back to that message uh, uh, listener who is agreeing with you and, uh, at that point I'll let you come in and, and have your say okay thank you Farai I'm happy that uh Towards the end of his uh, contribution, Honorable Mazisa was now conceding <laughs> that it's also a matter of concern for them. Because when you look at it from the constitutional framework, the constitution is very clear. In terms of section 107, vice presidents and ministers must attend parliament. And the word used is preemptory, it's not discretionary. So, in other words, honorable ministers are required by the law, in terms of the supreme law of the land, the constitution of Zimbabwe, 
to attend parliament. This is buttressed by the standing orders of parliament in terms of uh, section 26, they are required to attend, but section 63 goes further. Standing order 63 actually says it's a contempt of parliament if they don't attend without having sought leave of absence prior to the parliament sitting. It's different to the members of parliament where their attendance is not compulsory, so to speak. But for honorable means, it's only on Wednesday that they are required, where it's obligated for them to attend. On Tuesday, they can then attend to other matters. It's not obligated for them unless they've got a specific business, which is uh, before parliament. Mm -hmm. So in my view, this is actually disdain and uh, contempt of uh, the institution of parliament. And uh, I think you also gave the example of uh, Minister Obet Mpofu, who then says that no, he's not going to answer any questions. And he says, as long as uh, Temba Mliswa, Honorable Mliswa, is the chairperson of the committee, he will not come. But it's not for him to choose which chairs parliament committees, because that is a function of the Committee on Standing Rules and Orders, which is the one which appointed Honorable Temba Mliswa as the chairman for the Mines and Energy Portfolio Committee. So in that regard, you then have a scenario where, in my opinion, uh, the mindset has not changed. There's been no paradigm shift in terms of how the executive wants to conduct business. At least to his credit, I would say that uh, the Honorable President is now scheduling meetings in such a way that they end before the business of Parliament starts. But as Honorable Mazirisa considered, and properly so, in my view, on that occasion last week, we then had ministers who are members of the Politburo, who had been excused at one o'clock to attend Parliament, and they still did not turn up. You have got Honorable Minister Mbengegui, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs. When he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, the excuse given was that he's usually out on foreign trips with the former President, who, as you all know, was always gallivanting around the world. But be that as it may, now he's no longer Minister of Foreign Affairs. We understand that he had been given the responsibility of being the whip for the ministers, and yet it doesn't turn up in Parliament, Honorable Minister Mbengegui, and it's not the only one. You've got Honorable Minister David Parirenya, the Minister of Health. You've got questions which have been on the order paper, which have not been answered. You've got uh, the Minister of Finance. Fine. We understand that he has got uh, onerous responsibilities. But I have a question on the order paper since October last year. And what happens is that his ministry officials must prepare responses. And then any other minister can come and give a response. But that has not been done. And I raised it last week that you have got Honorable Minister of Finance. He has got a a deputy. deputy indeed, None of yeah. them were, it was there, there are only two deputies at the present moment mm. for agriculture and lands and finance. But both of them were not there. There's a question on the order paper which has been there since October up to now. Four months down the line, it has not been answered. That's the reason why I say that, uh, well, uh, I know we want to call it a new dispensation, but for me, there's nothing new about it. Honorable. When it comes, mm -hmm. sorry, let me just finish yeah, on yeah, the issue ahead. of our corruption. You will find a situation where, yes, my colleague here has talked about uh, the government trying to change to make things easier, the ease of doing business and so on. But look at corruption. You now have got a situation where all those people who are being uh, arrested, who are being targeted, are members who are perceived to belong to a different faction, the so-called G40. And what it means basically is that uh, we now have the law being used to target the political opponents of the president from his own party. Otherwise, there are members who are said to belong to... But I, I, you can tell me that when you've got one government where corruption it becomes a system, a way of life, then you can tell me that only members from one faction were responsible for that. To me, that does not make any sense at all. What we simply have here is selective application of the law. In other words, the law is now being used to target uh, political opponents as opposed to eradicating this cage of corruption. So when you have got that scenario, how are you going to attract investors when it's clear that uh, we are only talking about uh, nipping corruption in the bud, but in reality we are not doing so because there are so many uh, ministers and so many government officials who 
have been implicated, but who are not being arrested, probably because they are allies. Or perhaps inv- uh, investigations are underway. But uh, let me let me ask you this, Honorable Mazwi. So obviously, again, I know you want to, to respond to some of the issues but that have been raised. But specifically, you know, I, I want to make reference, uh, and I'll ask this both to you and uh, Honorable Gonesa, where, uh, you know, during these... Uh, committee hearings, the ones we made reference to with Honorable Minister Mpof, I remember then seeing a, a video that went around on social media where some of the MPs uh, that sit in that committee, uh, particularly those from the ruling party, you know, after the, the minister had left, there was an exchange of words, you know, and, and, and Zanu PF MPs kept saying, you know, you can't do this to our minister, you can't embarrass our minister, but I dare say he is not a particular. He is the people's minister, and so I think, you know, that is the culture that is MPs and as government officials is that 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 realization that you are accountable to the people, and so uh, you are not you are you are first and foremost a minister of the people of Zimbabwe before you are a minister of a particular party, and 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 and, and you know I think. I, I get worried or concerned when you hear those sort of things to say our minister. He is our minister, yes, as all of us as Zimbabweans. But I'll allow you to respond <laughs> to so many. Uh, look, the the incident to which you refer, uh, in particular uh, the person who made those remarks, yes, uh, I watched the same video and those remarks seem to come from a member of parliament who comes from ZANU-PF. Uh, but, you, you know, you, you, you've you got to be very careful, Farai, to draw conclusions that this is the general view within ZANU-PF when it's just something that was raised by a single uh, member of parliament. Uh, it cannot, therefore, become a general perception uh, or something that can warrant the forming of a general perception about ZANU-PF. Uh, but, of course, also, I think let's be very clear. Uh, the constitution is very clear uh, about... Uh, the freedom to for one to express oneself um, and uh, whether what has been expressed is something that is contrary to one's opinion I think is something that people need to learn to uh, uh, grasp and, and also to, to you know we need tolerance in, in the country uh, but whether that really forms the view of ZANU-PF I think is a completely different issue um, what, what is your view? Let, well, let's hear that. Well, the view is as it has been expressed by the president. Uh, mm-hmm. And we take our views and our cue from the president, who is the head of state and who is also the president of the, part, of the party. And he's been very clear uh, in terms of corruption. He says, obviously, that uh, we must pursue a zero, zero tolerance approach to corruption. Uh, we have seen uh, an, a concrete effort on his part uh, with the establishment of specialist anti-corruption uh, com- uh, corruption courts across the country. Uh, we have seen uh, you know, a certain disdain uh, for corruption, which we didn't quite see I- in previous times. Uh, and this all is coming from the president who is saying, we want a clean government. We want public funds to be used for public purposes. Uh, Honorable Gonese you know, said that uh, there was an incident uh, that happened in Parliament uh, with uh, Honorable Minister uh, Obed Mpof. I, you know, I want, I, I'm very careful and cautious not to comment on that because this, this is a matter uh, which is now before the Speaker of Parliament. The committee has not issued a report and the Speaker of Parliament has not pronounced the position of Parliament in respect of whether there was a contempt of Parliament or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you see, it's, it's very dangerous, especially for my brother, Leonard brother, who is a lawyer, uh, to seek to draw a very generalized conclusion based on a single incident and say because of incident A, uh, therefore it's not possible that we can conclude that uh, there are serious efforts to deal with corruption. I think that would be dangerous and, and it would be contrary really to, to the facts that are prevailing on the ground. The facts are really as simple as, as, as that. We, we have moved towards a direction of eradicating corruption and this is not going to be an event it's a process uh, and it involves stakeholders including parliament and that is why you have seen i think in the last few weeks a very concerted and and consistent effort on the part of various committees within parliament bringing in people and stakeholders state agencies to 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 account before parliament and explain really certain operations within their institutions and that is that is something that must be applauded i don't think that any reasonable person would condemn that 
Indeed, uh, Honorable Mazuisa, I couldn't help but think to myself as you were speaking, what worries me? I mean, you were speaking about the president and saying we agree with him, we get this direction from him and this is the position. You know, we heard the very same things that we got direction from the former president and now all of a sudden the party is turning around and completely disagreeing with what the former president said. So it, it's always concerning when you say we take our, but anyway, <laughs> neither here nor there. Mandlan Lovu says we should give credit where it matters. There has been significant change after the new dispensation. Very positive approaches to the luring of investors. The promise of a free, fair and transparent election is a step forward. Um, uh, I hope the Honorable Pre- the, His Excellency the President E.D. is even monitoring Ob- Honorable Obet Mpofu. This is from Mandla Mpofu in Nyamandlovu. Thank you so much for that contribution. I want to move now to the issue. I mean, we hear now about free, fair and uh, incredible elections. We understand that, uh, you know, there are certain electoral reforms that should get underway. Alignment of the Constitution, new Constitution to do, you know, to, those are all things that sit within the the ambit of parliament Mm -hmm. is there an urgency uh, in your view a a commitment to bring because you know whenever i speak to parliamentarians and say look why aren't you passing these laws i hear that the executive hasn't brought them is the executive now bringing these laws so that they can be passed uh, before your term expires well i would like to respond to that question i think you've raised a very important and uh, fundamental issue currently before parliament we have got uh, the electoral amendment uh, bill. Uh, it was actually uh, being debated uh, this afternoon. I made my contribution uh, last week on uh, Tuesday uh, during the course of the second reading. And when you look at uh, electoral reform, we have said it before. I'm a member of the Portfolio Committee on Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. When previous amendments were being uh, brought to the August House. They were very narrow in scope. They were not comprehensive. And with the current one, it focuses more on the issue of uh, the BVR uh, registration and also on issues of uh, proof of residence and so on. That is what it sets out. It leaves out so many things. And uh, we have said it, that uh, this uh, bill must be amended in a very comprehensive way. So that it deals with a lot of matters which have been uh, left unattended to. For instance, you look at uh, the issue of uh, media coverage. In terms of the current act, it only relates to the election period. In other words, during this period, which is referred to as the pre-election period, but parties are already in full swing trying to campaign. Uh, the including yours, <laughs> especially <laughs> this, yes. especially this. But theirs. the bottom line, the bottom <laughs> line, Farai, is that uh, at the present moment, ZEC does not have any power to regulate media coverage. It only applies after nomination, when it actually comes to the election period. And in my view, our bill should make it, uh, you know, a, or rather, the bill should amend the act in such a way that uh, when it comes to coverage on election matters. The ZEC should be able to regulate because of when it comes to the state media, when it comes to the public broadcaster, they must give fair coverage to all political parties. They don't have the current scenario, which is the reason why I will actually reiterate that there's really nothing new about this new dispensation. In the past, if you look at the coverage on ZTV, it was concentrating on two people. The former president, Robert Mugabe, and his wife. Now, under the new dispensation, it's also doing the same. We used to have live coverage of uh, the first ladies, uh, you know, the youth uh, interface rallies. Now what do you have? You have most of the coverage concentrated on the new president and also on his wife. She has had so many activities which are being given full coverage. The only if, difference... If, if, is there anything wrong with the in, newsworthy? In, no, including when she has gone to buy tomatoes and mangoes ah, by the roadside. No, there was that coverage. Yes. When you look at uh, the, the, the our party, the alternative to the current uh, governing party, we've also had a lot of programs which are hardly given coverage. So to me, we need to have uh, this electoral amendment bill uh, covering a lot of areas. You look at uh, the independence uh, of SEG, for example. 
we need to have a situation where ZEC is given all the power to make regulations. Currently, the act says that the minister has to approve of regulations. When it comes to the invitation of our election observers, again, this is within the purview of the executive. They've got a disproportionate power in terms of uh, inviting people. In my opinion, it should be left to the preserve of ZEC. Those are the, they are the election management body. You look at uh, the presence in the ZEC secretariat of so many ex-military people, and you know, as well as I do, that uh, the military in this country are political animals. Let me just ask you this, Honorable Goodness. In the absence, I mean, these are issues that you are saying you wanted to see in this in the in these Precise. amendments. Yes. Uh, if they are not brought, then what are you going to do? Well, you will appreciate that uh, in terms of our procedure, during the second reading, when we debate the general principles, we raise these issues. Right? We'll see how the minister responds. If the minister doesn't take our proposals on board, what it means is that as private members, we can propose amendments. But the sad reality is that uh, zanu PF is in a majority. So if the minister does not accede to the proposals that we have made. What it means is that uh, the governing party will have its way. As uh, my honorable colleague has already alluded to, we've got the whipping system. So obviously my counterpart, honorable Matruke, will then be directed to whip their MPs into line. So all those proposed amendments will not see the light of the day. So we are going to try to be very persuasive, but that's all we can do. We don't have the power to make the minister to introduce the amendments. And if we introduce amendments, we don't have any power because we're in a minority. So that's the sad reality. So although we will try to advance our arguments, we will try to persuade the minister so that, uh, you know, both the issue of uh, free and fair elections is critical. We have been talking about uh, investment in this country. A lot of this is going to hinge on the conduct of the elections. They must be credible. Only if we have got legitimacy. One of the reasons why... Uh, the, the current uh, government is the problems is because of our history of disputed elections. And for us to be able to attract the investment that we require, because right now we've had a lot of, uh, you know, hype about so many deals and so on. We have not seen anything tangible on the ground. For us to really see something meaningful, in my opinion, is going to be dependent on the kind of elections that we have elections which are not uh, disputed, elections which are universally accepted is having been free, fair, credible and peaceful. Honorable Mazuisa, your response to this issue, particularly of ensuring that, you know, what role will Parliament play to ensure that A, the elections are free, fair, credible and peaceful, particularly in terms of making sure that all those people who keep saying that we don't have reforms or these things aren't aligned are satisfied? Uh, but also, I think beyond that, to ensure that we have an atmosphere of peace uh, in these elections so we don't have violence. Yeah. Uh, look, Farai, um, there have been a number of laws that have been aligned uh, with the Constitution in keeping with the thrust of the Eighth uh, Parliament. And, and those bills uh, include the Land Commission Act, uh, the Criminal Procedure and Evidence Bill, uh, that, that's an al alignment law, um, Gender Commission Bill, uh, the National Peace and Reconciliation Bill, the Corporate Governance Bill. Uh, you've got a whole host of, of bills that have come to Parliament uh, in pursuance of ensuring that uh, we do what we are supposed to do as Parliament, and that is to align uh, the laws with the constitution the new constitution which came into being in 2013 uh, and and uh, i think i was listening to the speaker of parliament yesterday when he was at a, at a platform and he alluded to the fact that we have now reached about 30 percent in terms of our alignment mission as parliament uh, and and 30 percent if you consider the time frame uh, is, is is not a bad uh, really a uh, score um, you've got countries like Kenya, uh, which gave themselves 10 years to align laws with their constitution. Uh, ours is an open-ended uh, thing. And, and the alignment of laws, I have to be very clear about this, is not an event, as Honorable Gonesa would know. It, there are different procedures and, and protocols that must be followed. Uh, and, of course, uh, Parliament has a whole lot of other, uh, you know, functions that it must uh, consider uh, in, in terms of its mandate uh, as given by the Constitution of Zimbabwe. 
But in, in terms of uh, ensuring that we have free and fair elections, uh, I think, look, the role of parliament is to ensure that we uphold the constitution and we, we, we hold those institutions and government agencies to account and to make sure that whatever they're doing is in keeping with the constitution. I think, I think we've been doing that and, and we continue to legislate. That is also our role. But you know, you can on, only do so much as parliament. Uh, you can legislate, you can come up with a piece of legislation, that's fine. Uh, but that alone is not sufficient. You're going to need a whole uh, collaborative effort from different stakeholders. You're going to need political parties to have the political will to make sure that we, we have elections that are free, fair and credible and that they are held in an environment of peace. Um, and, and we have, I think, every Zimbabwean has witnessed in the last few weeks, regrettably, that there have been cases of intra-party violence uh, from a well-known opposition political party. Uh, and, and those are regrettable incidences. Uh, and they're incidents that we, some of us, hope that uh, should come to an end sooner rather than later. Honorable Gonese alluded also to the fact that uh, uh, look, the electoral amendment bill is not sufficiently catering for what he believes are some of the aspects that would ensure that we have elections that are free and fair. He pointed out specifically to the need uh, to ensure that state media uh, is fair and that it's balanced. It involves all stakeholders. But you see, I think it's important to draw a distinction between functions where the president uh, His Excellency President Mnangagwa attends in his capacity as head of state, where the first lady attends in her official capacity as the first lady. A and functions that are, you know, attended specifically and purely for political purposes. The state media must cover state events. It's as simple as that. But when we enter the electoral uh, environment and the electoral uh, season, it is then enjoined in terms of the laws, in terms of the Electoral Amendment Act, in terms of even the Constitution, to make sure that they give free, fair, balanced coverage to all political parties. And, and, and I mean, that is precisely what happens uh, during election period. That is what the, the chairperson of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission alluded to as well and insisted must happen during this election season. So, so it's important, I think, for people to draw a distinction and to really clarify issues so that we, we don't create an impression that is not there. If President Mnangagwa is attending a state function, he's attending in his capacity as head of state. Mlambo from Kariba, thank you so much. Says free and fair elections is the only way to attract investment. So far, there is more talk than real action. Nothing is tangible as of now. There is need to walk the talk. Uh, Honorable Gonese, can't these unconstitutional laws be challenged in the constitutional court to be struck down? Laws such as POSA and AIPA. Yes, I think that is a very important uh, contribution. You will find that um, in terms of what we've uh, tried to do is a, a parliament. We have obviously, uh, people might recall that uh, in the seventh parliament, actually introduced the private member's bill to amend some of uh, the most obnoxious uh, provisions <laughs> of uh, POSA. Unfortunately, I hit a brick wall. Uh, the bill was passed by the National Assembly, but we got stuck uh, in the Senate. The unfortunate thing really about uh, some of uh, these issues is that, uh, yes, you may take it to the Constitutional Court, but uh, there are times when I think that uh, some of the jurisprudence coming out of that court uh, leaves a lot uh, to be desired. What is more important, in my opinion, is that uh, let's have this commitment is a political parties to do what is best for our country. You find that in terms of its application, there's a very serious problem in terms of POSA where it comes to political gatherings. You will find that uh, the police, either through ignorance or through deliberate uh, misinterpretation, have misconstrued the provisions of POSA as giving them the power to permit people from uh, holding meetings when in fact the provisions of POSA simply require the convener of a public gathering or public demonstration to notify uh, the police. So this is one of the aspects which I would think needs to be amended in such a way that it becomes very clear that uh, the intention of POSA is simply that uh, the police must be notified, not that you are applying to them. Because you will find in their responses, they will even respond to your notification by saying that uh, we have received your application 
to hold <laughs> a meeting and we we refuse to give you permission because we don't have enough manpower and in so, that event so in my I'm going opinion, to ask uh, yes. just out, yeah. out of just interest now mm. in the event uh, that manpower Mm-hmm. Uh, reason that is cited is mm-hmm. that not valid though in law because uh, you know I understand that a certain na- a gathering of a certain number must have must be policed or, or monitored by once it reaches a certain amount there must be a certain number of security well it's not really provided for in such a specific uh, manner but what is important is that uh, obviously the police have a responsibility to maintain a law and order mm-hmm. but what is more interesting now is that uh, if you notify them and then they respond that uh, they've denied you uh, permission and then you go ahead to hold the meeting, they would have told you, for example, that they are covering the cricket match or something along those lines. You actually find truckloads of support unit officers coming to that same meeting where they would have said, no, you cannot go ahead because you don't have sufficient manpower. In other words, those are not uh, valid reasons. And in most instances, some of the gatherings would not really need that uh, amount of uh, manpower in the sense that uh, most of the time there will be no uh, real threat of any violence. And in any event, what they are required to be is to be on standby. Mm-hmm. So to me, those reasons are not valid. But more importantly, I think what the law should do is to vest more of these powers in courts of law. Mm-hmm. To say, for instance, that uh, if it is the police who feel that uh, the gathering should not ahead, it should be them who should approach judicial officers and not the other way around. Unfortunately, the current provisions are such that uh, when you have notified the police, and if they, in their wisdom or lack of it, they have not uh, uh, acceded, uh, then it's you who should approach our courts to have that overturned. But in most instances, particularly in the remote areas, most of the people who would want to have those meetings may not have you know, the resources or the time to actually approach the courts, and sometimes there is insufficient time. But I think what is important really is to have a situation where when it comes to the imparting of information, you should have, you know, the broadcasting laws, the IPA and so on, allowing more players. Uh, because at the present moment, you will find that um, the reason why we are very worried and concerned is because, for instance, when it comes to the electronic media, you will find that uh, the ones which have got uh, extensive coverage throughout the country are mostly the state media, in particular in respect of television. Mm-hmm. You don't have uh, private television stations. And I think it is imperative for us to really walk the talk. If we say that uh, this, uh, this is the public media, they should give fair and balanced coverage. Even during the election period, I know my colleague mm. was saying that uh, during the election period they give uh, you know balanced coverage. Because it's not true. To. It's not true. It's not even true. Because you will find that uh, they will just do the, the minimum that they can. Because I, I can refer your listeners to, to the last election, for example, in 2013. I don't think anyone seriously can say that uh, the coverage given to Robert Mugabe was the same as that given to Morgan Changrai. It's simply not true. Did you um, challenge that, though? Because I understand that there is a recourse that you can you can go to. Yes, we have tried to. But this is the reason why we say that uh, although the Constitution gives Zek the independence, but in terms of the actual practice, you will find that... Uh, the commissioners, I, don't, I think they may be scared, but if you recall, in the last election, two commissioners, I think it was uh, Professor J. Felto and another one, a lawyer from Blawayo, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, they actually resigned, you know, after the elections of 2013. And you could see that uh, clearly they were not very happy with the way uh, they, as members of ASEC, the way the institution had conducted itself. So you'll find that uh, I think the, some of the problems lie with the commissioners themselves. When they get there, I think they get scared. Even though the constitution gives them the power, they are not comfortable in exercising that power. Honorable Mazuisa, we know that uh, you know because we uh, all the talk seems to be about election. That clearly, you know, everyone is aware that very soon we will be going to elections and the term of this parliament will come to an end. Obviously, as, uh, as uh, you know, elected officials, as political animals, you have an eye on that election. Uh, given the fact that one, one eye is looking at the election and perhaps preparing a campaign, preparing to reach out, but you also have all this business on your plate to pass laws, to align the constitution. Is that enough time? Are you guys not distracted from that? 
No, no, I don't think so. Um, and, and I think ultimately it will boil down to discipline uh, and to uh, priorities uh, and to uh, whether or not your own party, uh, which you belong to, has really opened up uh, the, the, you know, various uh, campaign activities. Uh, because, you know, for example, in Zanopiev, I can tell you definitively that no one is allowed at this time to do any sort of campaigning. Uh, and I think that allows some of us who sit in Parliament to focus primarily on on on, on Parliament business. Uh, but for, I also wanted to uh, say something about POSA and IPA, which uh, you made reference to. You see, I, I'm a strong believer in uh, freedom of expression and assembly and association, and all the rest of it, because these are constitutionally guaranteed human rights, uh, and I think our constitution is very clear about that. Uh, and, and, and if these laws are impeding on people's freedoms, my personal view is that they must go. Uh, but the one difficulty that I have uh, with uh, a point that was raised by Honorable Gonesa is that he said uh, that he challenged at some point uh, the constitutionality of these laws and he took it all the way to, to the constitutional court and he didn't find any joy. Uh, and, and I didn't quite like and appreciate the way he put it that, uh, you know, some of the jurisprudence that comes out of our courts, le- you know, leaves a lot to be desired. I, I don't think that that's, <laughs> that's an appropriate way of putting things. You see, there's, there's a doctrine of separation of powers, which is entrenched in our constitution uh, and to which says that uh, there are different arms of government. There's the legislature, there's the executive and there's the judiciary. We have our role as parliament which is to legislate, uh, which is to hold various agencies and and, uh, institutions of government to account. The executive does what it does, uh, you know, uh, but the judiciary uh, has the singular mandate to interpret laws. And if for some reason we take something before the courts, uh, we must accept whatever interpretation the courts come up with. Uh, I think there has been a tendency, especially in the political uh, field in Zimbabwe, where political parties have tended to only support those decisions by courts that are expedient to their political persuasions. I think that that is not uh, something that we should support. I think that that is something that... Uh, compromises the independence ultimately of the judiciary, especially if, 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 if such sentiments are coming from lawyers and, and uh, members of parliament, I think they raise a lot of concern and, and worry uh, and, and it's something that I think we need to refrain from. Terry and Chivu, and the Terry Pachivu, I think is responding directly to the issue of race, but I, I think it's, you know, uh, I'm just trying to write back to him to ask him a question, and I also put it to you, Honorable Gonese and Honorable Masi. He says, surely ZANU-PF bought cars and gave judges farms. How do you expect an opposition a fair hearing? A fair hearing. <laughs> Let's be serious. But let me ask you this. I would want to avail evidence of, but, of but, that uh, but, claim. But, but let me ask you this, that mm. if, uh, you know, the, judges were allocated vehicles and the was it done out of ZANU-PF headquarters or by the government by the ministry that the appropriate ministry I can, and, I and, can and, and, so, and so my question then is yeah. mm-hmm. if it was uh, it was five not. if it was five six years ago and it was a government of national unity and this was done would it still be ZANU-PF giving or is it a government doing what it must do for the judiciary uh, how do you draw the line there it's, it's never been like that. Sorry, mm-hmm. Honorable okay. it's, it's never been that way. Zanopiev has never at any point at all given uh, cars to members of the judiciary. It's, it's just not factually sustainable. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that. Um, uh, if, if that has happened, it has happened from government. And uh, you, you have the Judicial Service Commission, which looks after those things, and, and, and it makes proposals and recommendations, and those things have proper channels, government channels, that have absolutely nothing to do with Zanopia. Okay, let me respond. I think what is very critical here is to appreciate that, uh, obviously, judges have got their conditions uh, of service. But I think what really compromised the judges more than anything else was the issue of farms. Because we have a scenario where obviously farms are not part of the conditions of service for the judges. Mm-hmm. What is part of their conditions of service is that they are supposed to be allocated uh, vehicles and also remuneration uh, which is reasonable considering their status in life. But then in 2000, when the land reform program began, I think that is 
one aspect which really compromised the judges. And also during the quasi fiscal activities of the governor of the Reserve Bank. Because then you have some other trinkets which were not coming directly from government, not directly from the Judicial Services Commission, but from the governor of the Reserve Bank. But more particularly, I want to dwell on the issue of farms. You then had some of the judges themselves being accused of illegally occupying some of the farms which they wanted to be allocated. But there was a stampede uh, to get the most lucrative farms at that point in time, particularly those where you have the infrastructure and things like that. I'm not going to name the individual judges, but it was in the public domain where some of the judges were actually being accused by some, you know, farmers that uh, they were camping. One of them was said to have actually <laughs> gone with a caravan to park at one of the farms which they wanted. And eventually that judge got that particular farm. And I believe that uh, in terms of uh, dispensing their justice, in terms of uh, executing their duties, I think this is where there was a problem. For some of the cases which were appearing before those very same judges related to the issue of land, and you have someone who is a direct beneficiary. And for me, when you've got your professionals like judges, to me it was actually more preferable to have a scenario where you have them you know, if they get adequate remuneration, they get paid handsomely. They will not need the farms. Let's leave, you know, the issue of farming to those who have got more. I know that as Zimbabweans, one can always use the argument that like everyone else, they are entitled to the farms and so on. And but for me, that mm -hmm. compromises them to a large extent because some of the lint cases which appeared before them, they will not be able to exercise the impartiality which is required of a judge. Let, let me stop point. you there. We've got a listener, Catherine Nichumath uh, in Alice Dale says, coverage by state media must improve and cover all political parties. I wouldn't like the 2030 situation, 2013 situation to be repeated where the Mbarech Meringa choir took center stage uh, and on our radio stations while we heard none from the opposition. Now, I want to ask one of the things that I, I know that again was decried by MPs was the fact that uh, under the previous uh, dispensation. I, I believe that there is a, a requirement for question time with the president, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is, is that, if I'm not mistaken, the, the president must come, I think, uh, periodically? Is, is that... Uh... Yes, there's that provision mm -hmm. that uh, the, it actually uses the word may. May, okay, yes. all right. So in other words, the right. president is got the discretion as to whether they want or they do not want. And it's different okay. for ministers. Ministers ah, okay. says must. All right. For the president, it's may. Okay. And we have already accommodated that in our standing orders. So the standing orders have already made provision for that to happen. And it's not a question of whether our new president is going to heed the call from the parliamentarians. Because I think it is quite important. Uh -huh. Because when you look at uh, the situation in South Africa, for example, they do have the president's question time. And I think that it is desirable to have that situation with the head of state. Uh, obviously, this is not going to be weekly like what we do with yeah, the ministers. Yeah. Uh, it's something which can be arranged whether it's going to be bi-monthly or whatever after every two months. But I think it is important for legislators to be able to question the head of state on those very critical matters. Mm -hmm. uh, as I have already indicated, it's something which is provided for but at the same time, it's not obligatory. And uh, since the standing orders are permissive, we're really looking forward to the president understanding and accepting that uh, this is something which is desirable. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much to all the listeners getting in touch with their uh, comments and contributions. Let me take a couple of more here. Um, Honorable Mazurisa, we have chiefs who are campaigning for us in the rural areas, which is against the constitution. Uh, what are you doing to stop the likes of uh, these chiefs from destroying any chance of free, fair and credible elections? I don't know how factual that claim is to start with. So it really uh, it would be problematic for me to draw inferences uh, based on insinuations that may not necessarily be backed up by facts. Uh, the fact is that uh, no one, uh, especially public office bearers, is supposed to act in the manner that is being suggested there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we always urge people, uh, you know, when such claims are brought to the fore, to report such to, to the police. 
The problem is people never actually do report those uh, cases to the police. And you know why? It's because in, 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 in most instances they are non-existent. They are fictitious. They are the creation of fiction and propaganda. Uh, to try and create a certain image and 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 you know uh, perception, uh, which would then impede on uh, on the freeness and fairness of the election that all of us want to be free and fair. Uh, so I would urge those people really to uh, take the necessary facts to the relevant authorities and get those matters looked into. Um, uh, otherwise, we we will just you know uh, risk entertaining things that are not factually supported. Well, uh, thank you very much, Fare. I don't know which country my colleague has been living in, because uh, we have Honorable Chief Charumbia, mm -hmm. and we've got Honorable Chief Msarurwa. We have been on public record. In fact, chiefs attend functions of Asano PF. You will find that uh, in the past, it was President Mugabe, they would actually make pronouncements live on television to say that they support ZANU PF. And they've already, already said so that they are going to support uh, the current president in the forthcoming elections. And Honorable Chief Msarurwa is actually said that uh, they cannot support a toddler. And uh, obviously referring to our current, our new president, President Nelson Chamisa. So as a matter of fact, this is something which has been happening. Unfortunately, when we, when we talked about the alignment of laws, there are certain laws which were supposed to be brought into effect. And I will quote specifically, if you look at uh, the Constitution, Section 282, it actually says an act of Parliament must provide for the conduct of our traditional leaders. That act of Parliament has not been brought into effect. And also, in terms of Section 287 of our Constitution, there's also provision for an integrity and ethics committee governing the conduct of chiefs. Again, that bill has not come to Parliament. If we doubt that done it, you'll find that uh, we'd have done with the issue of the code of conduct for traditionally. It would have been made easier now. Because in terms of uh, Section 15 of our Constitution, it actually provides for the neutrality of our traditional leaders that they should not be partisan and so on. Unfortunately, there's no accompanying legislation to make it easier to enforce. And again, you've got a lacuna in so many other provisions. For instance, uh, dealing with our civil servants. There's also an act of parliament which is supposed to be enacted in terms of the constitution. I think it's section 200, which has again not been brought before parliament. So in other words, you then have, uh, you referred to public officers. Civil servants are required by the constitution to be neutral. But more importantly, you're actually supposed to have uh, pieces of legislation which should be brought to align the provisions of the constitution with the legislation so that you specifically have uh, legislation which can actually penalize, which you can actually utilize to bring those people to order. This has not happened. And that quick, is where there's the lacuna. Uh, quick question that, uh, you know, I know a couple of people have been asking about this and maybe as MPs you could uh, assist us to find out if indeed it has happened. One of the refreshing things that we heard uh, was going to happen under the new dispensation was the fact that, uh, you know, ministers, public officers would be required to declare their assets. Uh, would you know if that has happened? Or maybe as MPs, could you ask or find out if that indeed has happened? Well, I read about it. I think uh, for the executive, uh, it was in the... But unfortunately for me, what is the uh, defective there is that um, it's, it's like a directive. which does not have uh, the force of law. And like what happened in the past, I remember it independence. I don't know whether you may be aware of this. We had a leadership court, <laughs> which mm -hmm. was supposed to govern the way uh, leaders in Zanu PF were supposed to, 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 to behave. That was never implemented. You will find that uh, they were not supposed to own businesses, for example, but most of them went ahead anyway. So I think what is lacking is really something which has got a legal effect. For instance, in Parliament, we have got a motion which is currently before Parliament has not been formally adopted, which actually requires legislators to also declare their assets and so on. But I think we need something more comprehensive. We need an act which actually is penal provisions and not just uh, where you can have mere rhetoric, where you just talk about it, but in terms of actual implementation, in terms of a uh, default, you don't have power to actually do something tangible to ensure that there's compliance. Before you come in, Honorable Mazwisa, you know, just take note of that response. I want to read a couple of more messages. Zivana and Blawaya says, as long as uh, ZBC takes orders from the ruling party, no other opposition rallies will be covered. Uh, and this, which... Uh, 
of which that must stop this year. Uh, Brian and Blue said, uh, um, you know, why is it that uh, state media refers to the president or any other ruling party member as comrade? Uh, are these workers a part of the ruling party or what? Because this is irritating. Uh, over to you, Honorable Mazwisa. <laughs> well, they, they <laughs> refer to ZANU-PF. Uh, well, this is, this is me uh, just presuming things, but... The, the one possible reason for that would be that zanu pf is uh, a party of the liberation struggle it's the party that brought about the freedom and independence that we all enjoy today including uh, the various opposition political parties here and so uh, that history uh, just for some natural reason accords comradeship to uh, members of that particular uh, liberation movement but look I, I want to once again speak about the chief's issue um my response uh, in respect of that issue that you raised about chiefs was really to do with uh, the person had said chiefs are disrupting and and impeding on free and fair elections uh, and and i asked that, for their, evidence. their yeah. conduct could potentially yeah, yeah well and and i asked that the, the, the that conduct the so-called conduct be uh, you know availed in evidence terms so that we are talking of evidence-based which honorable Ganesha did no 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 but you know what these chiefs, before they are chiefs, they are citizens of Zimbabwe. Uh-huh. And uh, as citizens of Zimbabwe, they are just equally protected uh, under the constitution, which protects everyone. And I, I'll refer you to section 60 of the constitution, which uh, speaks of the right to freedom of conscience. Uh, it says every person, it doesn't discriminate whether you are a chief, whether you are a lawyer, whether it says every person has the right to freedom of conscience, which includes A, freedom of thought, opinion, religion, or belief. I'll take you to section 61 of the Constitution, which speaks to the freedom of expression and uh, and freedom of media, but media is not relevant for my purposes here. But section 61, subsection 1 says, every person, again, has the right to freedom of expression, which includes freedom to seek, receive, and communicate ideas and other information. The problem that we have is that we have political parties that raise issues when it's politically expedient for them to do so. Uh, if, for example, I can tell you this very definitively, for I, that if these chiefs that have been cited by Honorable Gonese had said the same thing, but in support, just in support of the MDC, they would have absolutely no problem with it. It's just that it's the other way around. But the Constitution guarantees that right. It gives them that right. They are citizens of this country before they are office bearers. And the Constitution protects them. And it is right to do that. I think let me respond Mm -hmm. also referring to the Constitution. Very specific provision. Section 281. Principles to be observed by traditional leaders. Traditional leaders must not, and I underline the words, must not be members of any political party or in any way participate in partisan politics. B, act in a partisan manner. Further the interest of any political party or cause, or violate the fundamental rights and freedom of any persons. You will find that chiefs have been doing it. They've been violating the provisions which I have referred to. And further to that, you will find that our chiefs and uh, crawlies and so on, they've been asking people to produce you know, the registration slips, which is very intimidatory. And in past elections, we have actually had traditional leaders telling people to congregate at their homesteads and go to vote in mass. And so that is very intimidatory. What, what is more, the position on that particular issue of BVR slips? Because mm-hmm. uh, a couple of listeners have raised it. And I know when I interviewed the, the chairperson of the she said, look, I think what's required is some education to people to say no one has a right to ask you for that slip or that number. Uh, in any case, even if they do it, you know, it's, it's only for registry. Yeah. Because on the day, uh, it, it won't say that yeah. this registration number voted this way. However, for I, we, we can't do it. It is intimidating. Understand, but it is intimidating. Mm. And also, we are dealing with simple rural folk who don't understand the nitty gritties that uh, there's no linkage between that uh, BVR registration number and the actual ballot paper you will get on the voting day. But it's easier for us to understand. But that's not the same for an unsophisticated rural. Village. I'm sorry, but are you yes. suggesting that rural folk are not no, no. educated? No, no, it, it depends. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about and that they are ignorant. I'm talking of people who are unsophisticated. When it comes to intimidation, there is a difference in terms of levels of sophistication. So it's not just about education; it's also about levels of understanding. And unfortunately, this is something which is 
being taken advantage of, which is being capitalized upon by a political party which wants to use those tactics by all means. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I, I want to know very, very quickly this issue that you have both raised regarding chiefs, does that therefore mean that the constitution contradicts itself? It doesn't. Because, you see, we have got general provisions which relate to everyone. Then you have got certain specific provisions which relates to particular officers. Just like the army, you're looking at, you know, they are specifically covered that they must not act in a partisan manner. Like Farai, partisan. Uh, mm-hmm. just a quick one. Mm-hmm. The constitution is not contradicting itself. It's very clear. Uh, the section that he quoted, where, which says there must not be members of any political party. I don't think that there's any chief who has really come out publicly and openly to say I'm a member of this particular party. But it, it doesn't preclude them from expressing their opinion and their conscience. And so the constitution is very clear. There's no contradiction there. It's very clear that every person, as long as you are a citizen of this country, you are covered by this constitution. It's regrettable, mm-hmm. however, that you know the Honorable Gonese is is acting in a in a condescending way about no, rural no, people, no, 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 uh, and, and suggesting that they are unsophisticated, and suggesting, in fact, effectively that yeah. they are ignorant, and and it it then you know makes things a lot clearer why the opposition is having great difficulty penetrating the rural areas because you can't then go to the very people that you are disrespecting and treating in such a way and suggesting that they are uneducated. Right. Well, just if we join With literally 30 seconds because we have to end this discussion. Go ahead. All right. I think I just want to reiterate that it's not just about belonging to a political party. It's also acting in a partisan manner. So when you are afraid that in the interest of a political party, you are violating the constitution. We must end this discussion here. Thank you so much to the two MPs. Uh, obviously, it picked up and got a bit heated, <laughs> but that is the nature of uh, this program, and that is why uh, you know we bring it to you. Thank you so much to all the listeners who got in touch with us. It's been great interacting with you. Thank you so much for those messages. Thank you so much for those who tuned in and perhaps didn't get in touch. It is ZFM Stereo, my station, your station. Ask the MP only on this station. Thank you so much for tuning in and do keep it Z for the rest of your evening's entertainment. Good night.